The Winter of Red Snow, The Revolutionary War Diary of Abigail Jane Stewart, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, 1777. Reading 8. February 18, 1778, Wednesday. When Elizabeth returned from her day with Mrs. Washington, she took straight to bed. Her face was pale, and she said she could not think of eating. She rolled onto her side. What ails you, Beth? I asked. For the longest time she spoke not. Finally she began to cry. Through sobs all I could understand were the words, Those poor soldiers. February 19, 1778, Thursday. I brought my hunting shirt to Mrs. Washington's. It's quite nice, Abby, she said, and I know just the boy. Will you come with me tomorrow? Will I? I wore Elizabeth's clothes, two pairs of woolen socks, leggings, and my old wool skirt. Sally's cap is too small for my head, so Mama gave me hers. It was windy and gray. A lieutenant drove us past Mount Joy towards the main encampment and past rows of huts, the largest ones belonging to some of the officers. We stopped at the 2nd Pennsylvania Brigade, command by General Wayne, and stepped into the mud. There was a stench coming from between huts, and I knew why the instant I saw yellow snow and human waste. Such a filthy habit. If Mrs. Washington noticed, she said not. I followed her into the hut. We both bent over to avoid hitting our heads. It was dark therein, and so smoky my eyes immediately began to sting. The fireplace had a small iron kettle sitting on stones, but the wood was either wet or green, so it gave off no warmth. In a corner lay a pile of beef bones from an earlier meal. Each side of the small cabin had narrow bunks, stacked three high. On a lower one lay a soldier with no blanket, just bits of hay sprinkled over him for warmth. His bare feet stuck out at the end of the bed. His toes were black, the soles of his feet were dark green, and there was a smell of rotten meat coming from them. I pressed my hand to my mouth. A young girl sat next to him on her little travel bag, weeping. Mrs. Kern, said Mrs. Washington, may I offer you a prayer? The surgeon will take thine husband shortly. Yes, ma'am, please. The girl could not control her weeping, and I found myself crying, too. Following Mrs. Washington's example, I knelt in the cold dirt. The poor soldier was shivering as the, she took her hand in hers. Dear Lord, she began, please comfort this good man and his wife. Be with them. She embraced Mrs. Kern, a girl near Elizabeth's age. Just then we saw a shadow of men outside in a stretcher. My candle is hissing. February 20th, 1778, Friday. Again, gray and cold to finish about yesterday. Mrs. Washington and I visited eight huts. Each time she talked with the soldiers, asked about his family, then knelt to pray for him. If she was tired or as cold as I was, she uttered not one complaint. Near two o'clock in the afternoon, we came to a tent on the edge of the camp. Outside, a woman bent over a kettle of wash. Rags were wrapped around her feet. Mrs. Washington smiled at her. Good day, madam, she said. I'd like to introduce Miss Abigail Stewart. She's made a shirt I think will fit your boy nicely. He's yonder, my lady. Can you lift the fifes and drums over the hill next? Such a racket all day long, but I will give him my thy shirt, miss, she said to me, soon as he returns. God bless you. As we rode back towards the headquarters, I stared at the outer tents, small and shabby, most of them. There were laundry kettles and clotheslines were strung between branches. Mrs. Washington said drummer boys are paid seven and one-third dollars per month, and some are so young that their mothers camp nearby to care for them. She pulled her cloak up to her chin and turned stiffly to smile at me. The women offer so much help to the brigade, she said, but once an army is on the march again, going towards battle or from it, my husband says camp followances are a nuisance. The wind was cutting through my clothes, and when we neared the schoolhouse, which of course was now a hospital, I was beginning to shiver after so many hours outdoors. My stomach felt hollow with hunger, for I'd eaten just two biscuits for breakfast, and Mrs. Washington's food basket was now empty. Several dogs were slinking about, trying to get near a trough that was below the window. A soldier jabbed at them with his bayonet. But as he had no shoes, he remained standing on his hat and gave no chase. One dog lunged for the trough and ran off with what looked like a piece of wood in his mouth. Another did the same. Our wagon driver pulled the reins to a stop, but we did not get down. A man's scream from inside the schoolhouse was so horrible, so full of begging and pain, I looked at Mrs. Washington with tears in my eyes. "'What's happening?' I asked. 
She too could not hold back her tears. I'm afraid, my dear, the surgeon is at work. Then realizing the trough was overflowing, not with firewood, but with human hands and feet. February 21st, 1778, Saturday. I have felt heart sore all day. When I told Mama about the soldiers, I buried my head in her lap and cried. Elizabeth also came to the hearth. They're dying from the pox, she told us, trying to hold back tears. And the putrid fevers, Mama. I watched the surgeon soft a man's leg right before mine eyes. Elizabeth can now stop weeping. Mama stroked her hair. Finally, Elizabeth dried her face with her apron. The Polish soldier had a bullet clenched between his teeth to keep from screaming, but so great was his pain. Oh, Mama. When he opened his mouth to cry, the bullet dropped out back down his throat. While he was choking, the, sol the surgeon kept sawing, and he died right there. Dear, dear, said Mama. Sally sat next to us, nervously rocking Johnny's cradle. Why must his leg be cut off, she asked. Papa's voice came from the doorway. Because the soldiers have no shoes, the snow freezes their feet. He waited for him to say more. It's like the frost that kills Mama's roses, asked Sally. Yes, Papa said, but a soldier whose hand or foot freezes must have it removed if it turns black. Otherwise, the black turns to green. Green means infection. Papa took his coat off the peg and looked at us for a moment. His voice was soft. The only way to get rid of such an infection is to cut it off. I'm sorry, daughters, that ye had to see such suffering. It is late now. Mama is downstairs rocking Johnny, and I can hear Papa snoring. Just before our noon meal, Oni knocked on her door, asking if he'd help find her some eggs. How many do you need, Oni? Mama asked. Forty, ma'am. Forty? Yes, ma'am. Lady Washington is baking a cake for her husband as tomorrow is his birthday, his 46th birthday. His recipe calls for 40 eggs. Elizabeth and I spent the afternoon calling on neighbors while Papa waited in the wagon with our crate of wood ashes. We had 13 eggs ourselves, those small ones from our pullets. Mrs. Smith gave seven, and when we glanced up at the window by their chimney, there was Lucy looking out, but she moved away from the glass so quickly I had trouble believing that I had seen her. Her head was shaved. By three o'clock, we delivered 42 eggs to Mrs. Washington's kitchen. She herself did not receive us because she, the general, and several officers and their wives had just begun the evening meal. Oni said this way they'll finish eating before they need to use the candlelight. February 22nd, 1778, Sunday. Windy and dark all day. Worship seemed longer than usual. I saw Lucy's two sisters and their parents in the front pew, but no Lucy. They punished her by shaving her head, and to shame her will not let her wear a bonnet. How I grieve for her. Poor Lucy. Though the ride home was bitter cold, I was cheered by a distant sound of singing among the brigades. Papa said General Washington encourages his troops to attend divine services every Sunday and to pray daily. He also said this, To the distinguished character of a soldier and a patriot, it should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of a Christian. It was most comforting to hear the choruses of hymns on such a bleak day. After sundown, the festive music from a band brought us, with shawls quickly wrapped around our over shoulders from our hearth out on our step. The air was icy and the road dark, but we could see torches of neighbors coming on foot to headquarters. Papa let us girls hurry along the road with him. I was out of breath and my cheeks were numb when we arrived. An, an artillery brand... An artillery band was ser serenading General Washington. Mrs. Washington stepped outside, clapping her hands with pleasure. Thank you, thank you, she called to the cold men. How I love the sound of fifes and drums. Such a fine way to honor his birthday. The general and I thank ye. She took sh 15 shillings out of a tiny silk purse tied to her waist and paid the band leader. When she invited the musicians in, those of us watching turned for home. How they all fit in that snug house, I do not know, because soon there was dancing. Through the window I saw the general with his hands on his hips and his pigtail bouncing. He was doing a jig. February 23rd, 1778, Monday. When Elizabeth and I picked up the laundry at headquarters, Mrs. Washington invited us into the warm kitchen. There was a pewter plate. There on a pewter plate were two silvers of cake. I saved these for you girls, some of old man's birthday cake. Here you go. It had been so many weeks since either of us had eaten anything so delicious. 
I tried to be polite, but forgot my mouth was full when I asked for her recipe. And crumbs spit out over my apron. Elizabeth scolded me with her eyes, but if Mrs. Washington noticed my bad manners, she said not. From her husband's desk, she took up a fresh piece of paper, dipped his quill in ink, and wrote down the recipe, which I shall keep between pages of this journal, instead of copying it all down. I remember the ingredients, but not how it's put together. Forty eggs, four pounds of butter, four pounds of sugar powdered, five pounds of flour, five pounds of fruit, mace and nutmeg, wine, and some fresh brandy. Mama hugged us and laughed. It's good you were able to taste such a fine cake, she said, because the day we have 40 eggs and four pounds of sugar to spare will be the day I grow wings. The wind beat against the house all day long so that we only felt it blow through the cracks and under the door. Only the fire and hot kettle of wash kept us warm. A great noise of horses and wagons passed on by the way to headquarters, but we were unable to see the steamy windows. Sally demanded I let her wear my shoes outside so she could watch the visitors, but when I refused, she smacked our long spoon against the stones until it splintered in half. She struck her, she stuck her jaw out and was not at all sorry for her temper. I was sore pleased when Mama put her in the corner with a swat. Johnny is looking a bit more rosy in the cheeks. We lay him on the plated rug on his stomach, and after several minutes of wiggling, he rolled over onto his back with a thump. He was so surprised, he let out a howl and would not stop until I picked him up. Sally sulked all day. February 24th, 1778, Tuesday. Elizabeth and I saw the new person standing by General Washington's fireplace. His name is Baron von Steuben, and he is as stout and ugly as the nose. At his side was a dog, a greyhound with a thin blue collar. His name is Azor, a well-more-mannered dog I've never seen. Because when General Washington offered him a cracker, he politely lifted his paw, put it, in the, put it on the general's knee, then daintily took a bite. Azor holds his head high, as if posting, posing for a portrait. I should like to play fetch with him. As we carried the laundry downstairs, Billy Lee told us that when Benjamin Franklin was in Paris, he met von Steuben and asked him to sail to America to help train our soldiers. He is an army officer from Prussia and speaks no English, but brought an interpreter with him, a young Frenchman. There, see that boy by the window, pointed Billy Lee. His name is Pierre. I heard no more because I, and especially Elizabeth, could not take our eyes off the boy. He was perhaps 17 years of age and was striking in his looks. Dark hair swept back into a queue with a ribbon that matched his red waistcoat. His white pants were tucked into his small black riding boots and he was trim. He was speaking in French to one of the aides, Mr. Alexander Hamilton. They both laughed and continued a lively exchange. Mrs. Billy Lee said us, gently trying to usher us to the door. I do not want to leave, nor did Elizabeth, but leave we did. A wagon outside was being prepared to take the Baron and his charming interpreter to their quarters, Slab Tavern. With them would go their private chef and valet, and of course Azor. This is what Elizabeth said on her way home. I think we shall begin sewing right away. What shall you sew? I asked. Pierre needs a good American coat, she answered. I knew Elizabeth. She did not get what she wanted with her first bounty coat, She was so she was going to try again. But she must have forgotten one thing. We have no cloth. February 25th, 1778, Wednesday. Elizabeth had not forgotten we have no cloth. Without asking Mama or saying anything to me, she went upstairs and took apart her cloak, seam by seam. This I found out later. Now neither of us has anything warm to wear over our dresses. I hate her. She cares not for anyone but herself. Worst of all, she did this secretly, pretending the reason she wanted not to go outside was because she didn't feel well. When I asked if I could wear her cloak, she said no, that she had a snag in it on the fence and was mending the sleeve. She lied, and I believed her. So when we went to Slab Tavern with only shawls to warm us, I thought nothing of it. We had a basket of corn cakes Mama baked for the Baron and some for the reason I did not question Elizabeth about the package in her arms wrapped with a string. Slab Tavern is called such because of the large stone slab below the door. A wood sign above shows a horseman at full gallop. From here, it is a short walk to headquarters, but first you must cross the creek and pass Joseph Mon's cabin. Inside were smoke and loud voices. Azor lay by the hearth, lapping up a bowl of toddy. 
Von Steuben sat nearby with his pipe. His valet stood behind him, plating his pigtail. They looked not at us until we stood inches in front of them. We curtsied and held out the corn cakes. The Baron said something we understood not, then turned to his assistant. Vogel, he called. Then Vogel asked to us, Little ladies, Lieutenant General Baron Frederick Wilhelm Ludolf Gerard Augustin von Steuben says thank ye. Now goodbye. Elizabeth curtsied again and quickly held out her package. This is a gift for Pierre, she said, from an American admirer. My name is inside the college, sir. Please tell him. She backed away, tugging at my arm, for I stood speechless, finally understanding what she'd done with her beautiful blue cloak. February 26, 1778, Thursday. I have not spoken to Elizabeth since yesterday morning. I am too cross to even tell Mama what she has done. Sleet and wind all day, we stayed in. For dessert, after supper, we roasted hickory nuts in Mama's long pan. February 27, 1778, Friday. A great miracle has happened at Valley Forge. We heard shouts early this morning and saw many neighbors running and driving their wagons toward the skull kill. Two miles above headquarters at Pauling's Ford, we saw nearly a hundred cavalrymen riding into the icy water. The shad are running, came the cry. Shad? Papa said in amazement. This time of year? We stood near the Perikaman Creek where it flowed to, toward the skull kill and watched. The soldiers formed a line across the river, wading their horses upstream while beating the surface with branches. How cold their fingers must be, thought I. Those standing in the shallows threw nets and pulled in shad by the thousands. These men were shaking with cold and their hams and lips were blue, but they kept working. Finally, an officer started a victory chant and soon all were out in the river and drying off with blankets brought by some of us. Along the banks, many soldiers dropped to their knees in exhaustion, I thought, but soon I realized that they were praying. Why? I asked Papa. He looked down at me and drew me into his warm arms. Why? The famine is over, Abigail. Their prayers and mine have been answered. A river overflowing with fish in the middle of winter? It has not happened in thine lifetime, nor mine. Only Almighty God could arrange such a miracle, my daughter, and these good men are thanking him. A horseman caught up with us on the road back from the river and tossed a wet sack of fish onto the back of our wagon. For thy family, Mr. Stewart, he called and was off. Papa waved his mitted hand and took up the reins. His beard was covered with frost, but still I saw him smile. Mama baked the shad and vinegar and rolled up each piece. Sisters and I helped tuck them into jars into which we poured vinegar and onions in a pickle, then held dripping candles over them to seal. Our house stinks, but the pantry is full again.